Um, we'll get going then. Um, my name is Jim Now. I am the managing partner for uh, Rationales. Um, we are a New York State only craft beer bar in Williamsville, New York. Um, my background is, and uh, Eric will be one about himself. My background is uh, I used to be a brewer at Elegant Bill Brewing Company in the late 90s, early 2000s. And I kind of left the industry, came back, went over to the restaurant side. Um, I actually own one location of EBC. Um, I've been a restaurant consultant for US Foods. Uh, a couple of years ago, I spoke in that capacity. Um, and then we opened up Rationale. So not going to tell you how to make hazy beers or sour beers or what a London 3 yeast is. I have no idea. We're going to talk a lot about your, your taproom operations and everything else like that. So um, uh, I'm going to let Eric introduce himself, too. Alrighty. Hi, everybody. My name is Eric Coleman. Uh, very fortunate been in the craft beer and beverage business 25 plus years. Uh, I own Beer by Coleman, which is consultancy where I've been able to help open up one companies uh, around West New York, New York State, and uh, throughout the country. I am the director of Trocare College's Brewing Distillation Fermentation Program, which is kind of mothballed, but uh, I then also uh, had the great fortune to work with Jim in opening up rationales, and then I also do a lot of corporate virtual tasting events. And rolling right from that into this topic, um, Jim and I have had the great fortune of knowing Paul many years and working with the association. And that kind of ties in, as Jim said, you know, we only, on our taps, we have 18 uh, beer taps. And in our merch cooler is only New York State liquid, you know, just putting our money where our mouth is and promoting local. But one of the things that we've been speaking on uh, as a common thread is working on the tap room because whether you're a brewing company that just has more of a tasting room all the way to those who have a full-blown restaurant, you're going to be touching on this subject in some form or another. So what we're going to do this year is make it a little more open and a little more immersive and interactive. So we're going to re you know, talk a little bit about uh, repeat of last year's conversation. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about what we've learned at Rationale. Uh, Jim also owns EBC in Fredonia and he's been running stuff I've been helping him open up but as somebody I can speak for myself, and I know, you know I've heard your comments. Um, having opened up Rationales as owners, just the intricacies that all of you have experienced or are about to experience. Um, we're trying to keep this a little more, a less presentation, a little less on the slides, really making this more immersive, creating a lot of open forum. And actually, Jim has been pushing on Paul to do this, where we can get more questions from you all, because any one of us could probably get up and talk about some kind of a subject. And while that may be beneficial and important for everybody, uh, that, that hive mindset and really utilizing all the talent in the room to help answer questions, get questions from all of you that are real world uh, practical application are kind of what we're looking at. Yeah, so if you, yeah, you, you stole my, my intro there. Well, yeah. So I'm going I'm to let them do the service spectrum. But before we do that, anyone has a question, just raise your hand, we'll stop, we'll answer the questions. Like, like Eric said, I, I really push Paul for, I think one of the great things about this conference is you know, we're willing to share a lot of knowledge and ideas and everything else like that. The Bill Chavez woman said the same thing. You know, like, we're here to answer any questions you have. I like the idea of office hours. I like the idea of people asking other people beforehand, hey, these are the questions that we all have. Can we get some people up here to talk about what the answers might be? And then just be in the room and, and ask those questions. So hopefully, we're going to move through this quick. This is a little bit of a repeat. We had some stuff from the last time we gave this talk, but it's going to be a little bit of a repeat. But then we just kind of want to open it up to questions and stuff like that. So why don't you kick off the, the service spectrum? Copy that. So um, in the service spectrum, there's many different ways you can run whatever kind of a tasting room or tap room that you have. Um, the, the easiest one that everybody can come to mind is full service. You think of like Druthers, Big Ditch Brewing Company, where it's a standard service model. You have servers, bartenders, a lot of support staff. Um, it is the highest level of hospitality. You do have the most interactions. Uh, printed menus uh, and just very hands-on and then the flip side of that is when you go into a self-service model and think of more like Panera Bread is the easiest one for everybody or Aslan in uh, Pittsburgh um, where you have a kiosk it's online ordering a QR code thing of that nature you know very minimal service interaction uh, the, the hospitality is also then great re greatly reduced because you're not having that that human touch per se um, you still will have some bartenders that will be there to help, you know, facilitate, you know, getting the liquid out. Um, most of the time they don't have printed menus, and then it is definitely much more tech heavy to be able to facilitate that model. And those are the ones that, you know, we've kind of known for the longer stretch. And then I'm going to let Jim talk about 
you know, some of the trends that are coming up and things that have been repeatedly used. Yeah, when you get into that self-service model, that is going to require a lot more technology, right? You're going to have online menus, you're going to have potentially online ordering systems and things like that. So it does take a little skill set in that or paying someone an IT guy or something else like that. Um, at Rationales, we decided to kind of do a hybrid model of that. So um, in the hybrid model, think, you know, sometimes you're doing full service, sometimes you're doing self-service. We use Toast POS. I'm not going to give an endorsement of them or anything else like that, but they do have the ability to have a QR code at each table, so your guests could literally walk into the restaurant, start their check, complete the entire thing, the server comes over, drops off beers, or answers questions, or does something else like that, but doesn't necessarily have to interact that much with the, uh, with the guest. Um, it allow, the hybrid model allows the customer to decide. That is one thing we learned. We thought we were gonna tell them how to do it. You actually have to let the customer uh, learn how to do that, but um, you have to train the staff and you have to train the customer, right? You have to train the staff. It's, it's a little bit complicated, the technology, when you get into these hybrid models, depending upon what solution you're using. But it's also when that guest comes in, you know, are they going to sit down? Is someone going to greet them and treat them and start them down the path of a full service type uh, situation that you would in a typical restaurant? Or is that customer going to come in and just scan that QR code? Are they going to walk in and sit down at the table and scan that QR code before you even get to them? So there's some training that has to happen, like I said, with both the staff and the customer. Again, it's going to be tech heavy, potentially even a little more tech heavy than self-service because now you have, to have a, you have to have a tech solution that works under both of those environments so it can get a little bit more complicated. Those were the three that we did the last time we gave this presentation. We kind of thought of two more models that, that we've seen um, at, at different locations along those lines. And I don't mean to say like you're either full service or you're self service or you're hybrid model or you're these other two. You could be a combination of all of these, but um, the split model is one that I've seen a lot. So um, the, the ones that come to mind for me are threes I've been to. Uh, it's been a while, but threes down in Brooklyn. Fidens, which is local here. One Eyed Cat is out near us in. Um, in Williamsville, and, and what you have in that split model is you have the food separate from the beer and the bar, right? That could be a completely separate legal entity doing the food, and then actually Personal Best was another one we just went to, we, we were with the guys down at Personal Best. Um, so you have a, a different legal entity that's running and operating that kitchen and more of that restaurant experience, and then you have the brewery doing more of just a straight up tap room experience. Um, you could rotate that kitchen. Uh, NO3s used to rotate that kitchen, so there's, a, there's some pluses and minuses to that. Um, and like I said, you have, you, we'll talk about some issues with the different legal entities, and uh, you may have to, to set up different ownership. Although I believe I've been to a few of them uh, where they've decided to have that split model, but it's still the same ownership, and they just <coughs> chose to operate the restaurant that way. And then the last one, I kind of got booed off stage the last time I did this, was self-pour taps. Um, show of hands, who's seen or used a self-pour tap before? Show of hands, who likes those self-pour taps? Okay, there's a few more than the last time I did that. Exactly. Listen, every time I talk to a brewer, they think it's the worst, the worst thing ever. And, and, and I understand that I made beer. I used to put that beer down. And this is Fred's Matthew Club, by the way. I put that beer down and made that beer, and I was really proud of it. And I wanted to talk about it and everything else like that. Um, I will say this, they are coming, they are the lowest customer service, right? You don't really need to have anyone there. I think the places that do it well do have, Eric loves to say the word concierge, they do have a beer concierge there talking about the beers, explaining that. But no matter how well you explain that beer, you're never going to know if you really like it or not until you taste it and you put it in your mouth. And that's what I think these self pour walls are really good at. You're getting paid for that sample every time. Think about what... Run that loss of what your samples are and think about that revenue, and that revenue could be going into your pocket. Um, they, are, they are the lowest customer service, typically. Um, you can sometimes pair them with other models. Um, I've got some buddies that opened a place called The Ridge in West Seneca out in Buffalo, and they did full service restaurant, not even the hybrid model, no QR codes or anything else like that, full service in the front. And then they did a south pour wall in the back, and, and, and they, they kill it sometimes. I mean, it, it has its applications for, for certain events and things like that. It is gaining traction. So I know, like again, the brewers might be like, oh, this is my pride and joy, and you're just sticking on a wall and let people pour it and do whatever. Um, but I, I do think we're going to start to see a lot more of it um, as it comes. So Eric's going to talk a little bit about the pros and cons. Oh, question was it? I was going to say, my issue with the cell phone wall was not with the interaction or anything like that. It was the poor poorly, and you had a ton of loss and waste and whatever. I guess, like you're saying, you're, you're having to pay for that loss. But it, it, it felt like uh, 
something that a customer wouldn't wouldn't enjoy as uh, as like watching their uh, their money kind of tick up as well. <coughs> You said they poured poorly, like the customer poured the beer poorly, no, or the, no, no, the, the system? The taps themselves poured poorly. Uh, there's a place called Randolph Beer okay. in, uh, in Brooklyn that um, I just, I, when I tried it, I remember I had like a preloaded cart or whatever, and uh, I went to four, and I got half a glass of foam, and it charged me for every single ounce of that glass. So that was the only thing that I would say is like, was what I saw. You should not do it on social media, but give them a, an email and say, hey, your, your wall is pouring poorly and you need to fix that. Hopefully, you know, you can get a draft tech or you can get a system. I don't know the names of the systems. I, I think there's Pour My Beer and uh, I forget what the other one is. Uh, you, you all would probably know better than us. We're not here to, to tell you what they are. Um, but there are certain ones that integrate with certain POS systems, certain ones that stand alone, certain ones that were integrate with other POS systems. Um, I've seen it executed really well, and I've seen it installed in the stupidest spot, and executed really poorly. And thought like, why did you even do that? Is it is it bringing you any value? It probably just has hurt uh, the places for doing it. And it's not just breweries, right? I mean, they're they're popping up in different places, all over the place. So why don't you walk them through quick the pros and cons of the uh, yeah, and you know remember there is no right or wrong answer. As we all know, everybody in this room, you want to make beer that you want to make. And then, uh, you know, running a brewing school, I tell everybody, like, you make what you want to make down the road. After you've made money, you're going to brew what people are going to buy and drink. Um, and with that being said, you know, every one of these things have their place and time. But it's also not bad to help really push that, uh, you know, that ever-changing, uh, you know, acceptance of things. So with the full service, pros, it's been around forever. It's what your grandparents know. It's what your parents know. It's what, you know, anybody here who's over the age of drinking age still can remember a little bit. Uh, it's the rule, not the exception. It's kind of just what has always been known. The benefit is you also do get a higher check average. That is, Jim touched on it earlier, you get that interaction. You get somebody to be able to show up, talk about it. You know, a lot of brewing companies who have the full-blown restaurant or tap room, you'll, you'll have beer tenders, and the people are going to come up, and you know, hopefully you've been in, had the opportunity to make them all level one Cicerones, where they can actually come up and really describe that beer and be a brand ambassador. Um, and then that throw follows right into the increased hospitality. It's experiential. I know Jim loves it when I use that word. <laughs> but it's a matter of it. It just ties into that. You really get that full-blown experience, all the oohs and ahs that go with it. And people you know, get a little, a little bit of edutainment, as I like to say, uh, as they're going along with that. But flip side of that is, as we all know, what is the number one killer of all of our profit models? is labor you know just that that is the demon that we all have to pay attention to when you're using that full service your labor is going to be the highest yes question so how do you deal with over serving and under drinking if you have a word wrong now with that and jim so yeah uh, go ahead the models that i've seen that that's a good question yeah no um the models that i've seen uh you have to go check back in after a certain number of ounces so that was their agreement. They, they did get some pushback. I wasn't in, I, I actually should have asked that when I was in the SLA meeting. Um, but the SLA was concerned about over, over serving and everything else like that. So they would make them, I don't remember the number of ounces, but once you hit a certain number of ounces, you had to go back in and check in with a person to make sure that you weren't over served at that point and then they would allow you to. Yeah, the, it's usually... It's a good question. It, it's based on ounces. It's not necessarily the number of beers that you have. There's a facility that opened up in West New York that Anytime I would go up and get a beer, it, it was based on the number of ounces tied to mine, so it wasn't even like two pints. Was once I hit 30 ounces, I had to go see somebody reload, show my ID again and everything else just to be able to keep pouring the liquid. Good question over here. Yeah. Uh, it's really just an answer to that. Uh, the one in Syracuse has 40 ounces for two ounces. So you have time when once you start pouring, you can't drink more than 40 ounces in two hours. A beer and a quarter per hour. <laughs> no, but that makes you, sense. You so, can't do it, or you have to check back in. You have to get unlocked for. Don't worry, Kyle. You can still go there. You can. You can get here. Sharing your car with significant other. It's. Yeah, you don't want to do that. <laughs> yeah, no. The, and actually, a lot of times when they put the bracelet on, at least a few of the places that I've been to, you know, I'm going to get a beer, like, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm reloading, and then, you know, or my wife maybe started, and I went up to reload, and, like, you weren't the person who came up. That's not your ID tied with the, the credit card that's holding the account. They made my wife come back up and the one to authorize it, even though, you know, she's my wife. 
And that's like, you gotta, no matter what system you're gonna learn, you gotta, you gotta get work the kinks out, right? Yeah. Talk about the kinks that we had uh, at Rationales with our model. Um, alrighty, so the cons of all of this, which we kind of float into, which we all know is, you know, that increased labor is the highest labor model when you're dealing with the full service. You have the bartenders, you have the servers, you have the busters, sometimes you have the bar back. Um, you have a host, you have, you have everyone. Usually they're reserved for places that do have a little bit more of a dining experience, a bigger menu, sometimes also a larger facility. Uh, more training, you have more bodies on the floor, so therefore you gotta make sure those standardized processes, the SOPs that hopefully you're all using, you're getting that out there. Uh, slower turn time, that is something because somebody has to go out and touch that and then get the order in, and by the time that ticket hits the KDS, and by the time that comes up, and then by the time somebody runs the food out or the server gets there, you know, that does impact how you're handling the volume, especially if, a, if you have a larger facility or, as we all know, a larger outdoor space in the summertime. You want to make sure, you know, that, that turn time is key. And then printed menus, as we also all know, and I'm more of a printed tactile person. Uh, Jim is more of a tech person, and it's a matter of... Uh, um, with the printed menu, they get really jacked up pretty quickly, and then so you constantly print them, even if you try to laminate them or use some kind of special paper, it's a little bit tougher. And then um, the cons is, you know, larger spaces, it just it's just the bigger the space, the more work it is to get that going. And on the flip side of that, when you're getting into the, uh, the self-service model, lowest labor. Obviously, right there, there is minimal labor uh, because the customer is, you know, doing most of the work. Um, that was supposed to say that. No, it was supposed to say smaller footprint, too. Yeah, smaller footprint. Yeah, smaller footprint. Um, and then, obviously, when you do have that self-service model where they're just scanning and then they're going up to an area to pick up you know, their food and they're going to pick up their beer, uh, it's, it's definitely a quicker turnaround. You're able to handle more volume in that same span of time just because you know, you're putting the onus on the customer uh, for that. Jim, you want to talk about you know, the cons? Sure. Or? So it can be a, a little bit, again, tech heavy. If you're setting up a kiosk or you're using a QR code or something else like that, you, you got to be able to configure that and make sure it's working the way you want. Um, it can be confusing, right? Again, you know, it's easy to train your staff, but every new customer that comes in there and hasn't done this process, how are you training that customer? Um, are you training them by putting something on the wall and having them read it? Are you training them with one body that's more of that concierge going around picking up glasses? Stuff like that, but you, you do have to remember it's, it's training that customer in a situation like this. And let's be frank, not everybody likes it um, to put the cart before the horse. We will talk about what we did at Rationales. We had a lot of people, our hybrid model did both of these, the first two. Um, we had a lot of people that just left a bad review because they just didn't want to do a QR code or they were really upset that we would even ask them to do it. So you, you, you do have to think about who's your clientele and, and not everyone's going to like it. The hybrid model, I mean, you get the best of both worlds, right? You get the ability to give that full service with, with um, you know, a little bit more uh, hospitality and everything else like that. It definitely does decrease labor because some percentage of your customers are going to take advantage of that, more of that self-serve model. Um, so you're, you can staff with fewer people. You know what else that does? That increases the tips. Overall, we found that our employees make more tips in a hybrid model than they would in a full service model because some customers will do the work, they'll put the order in or they'll do some of the work, they'll cash out, we'll turn the table quicker, whatever that is. Um, and so it's really coaching, uh, you talk about, I should say, you have to train the staff to find that it's okay to use this QR code. They want to do all of the service steps, they don't want to let the customer use the QR code occasionally. But what that does, it allows them to have a larger set of tables. I mean, our typical servers are, are probably doing eight to nine table sections because a quarter to a half of those tables are using that QR code and they're simply running the food or they're simply talking to the customer about what they want next. They're not putting the order in. They're not cashing the customer out. That's a huge savings time on that. Um, there is a little bit of a lower um, service expectation, which is kind of nice, right? If you go into a place that's a hybrid model, maybe you're not expecting to get you know, fine dining, white tablecloth service. So the customers are gonna be a little bit more relaxed and not necessarily expect that. Uh, the cons, it's tech heavy, it is. I mean, the QR code system that we did, it took a while to set up, it took, you know, we had to tweak it a bunch of times. We had to tweak it for, for how we wanted to use it and how we thought it was actually gonna work. There is a little bit lower customer engagement on that, so your customers aren't necessarily interacting with your staff as much. Training point, it is really, really important to train your staff that when you do get to the table, to be as hospitable as possible. We always want that anyway, even if it's a full service. Um, model, but, but really teaching them, like, hey, your job is to just 
be there and be present and, and be the hospitality component of this because they're going to take a lot of the transactional work off your off your shoulders. Um, it is probably the most trained because you got to train your staff and you got to train your customers. Give me one second, I'll answer that. Your staff and your customers uh, on how this system's going to work. Right? Someone's going to come in and make a decision which path they're going to go, and you need to make sure you've trained your customer, your employees how to do that. You do get quicker turn time, you do get quicker volume. We definitely see a faster um, turnover of the tables using the, the, the hybrid model. Question over here. Yes, the QR code on the tables. Correct. Uh, yep. So we have a tab that we online and stuff, so like a ring sign. We thought about doing QR codes on our tables, but the tables are also kind of fluid and kind of moving around. So it's a fun Q, like, like, I'm just trying to understand like best practices for that type of model. Because we thought about going to that to try to help kind of like move gear through the space without having to sure. find it developed. Yeah, so um, our system, and again, we use Toast, it allows you to put a QR code at a table. Actually, we have one of our owners that has our business right down the street. And he has a QR code in his office and he orders his lunch before he comes down and gets it. But, uh, and uh, if any of you are in a hotel or anything else like that, um, QR codes in those rooms, so you individually know what room is gonna get. Well, we've, we've, we really tried to do that with a place across the street and they wouldn't let us. But um, you know, there's a lot of cool applications for it. But the QR code in a standard setting is it's gonna be one per table, right? We have a 10 person table where we have two QR codes on there and one is the front and one is the back. You have to label them accordingly, but it's two separate tables in the system, even though it's one physical table. And multiple people can join that group. They can scan that QR code. They can hop on someone else's check. They can not hop on that other person's check. Um, once they're done, it, it will automatically cash them out. I, I don't have all the time in the world to explain the technical component of it, but there's not as many issues as you'd think with someone coming down and, and starting that QR code. And if you sit down and there's a check that's already open, it's more than likely if you don't say, hey, start a new, if you say start a new check, it's going to automatically close the old check. You, you do get credit card information. There's pre-authorizing cards and stuff like that, too, that has to take place, which gets a little bit um, sometimes confusing for the customers. But um, overall, I, especially if you have a big outdoor space or you get long queues to get your beer, you will pour beer faster. There's no doubt about it. There's only one time where we don't do it. We have a festival every um, Thursday in the summer called Music on Main. We have a 100 person inside capacity, about 200 to 250 outside. And it, there's all of 350 people in that place. And if we tried to do QR codes, even to get through it, to get people to get their drinks, it would be just a nightmare. So we make them come to the bar. But typically on, on every other night, we're able to, I mean, people, we have QR codes on the posts that hold up our second story patio. Because people stand underneath it. And there's little things there. And you scan a QR code in the garage door window because people sit on both sides of it. You can really put them anywhere and it works. It works really well. And to that note, really quick, to kind of dovetail the very end of that, um, we found the guest experience, if they know they're scanning uh, and ordering at a QR scan, they're going to stay there until they get their beer because, yes, the wandering around happens even in our place. And you get a little bit, but people are like, oh, I want my beer. i got to stay here, and then I'll join you because it's there. So I wouldn't worry about that too much. People will get used to that. I've always said, imagine you're getting great service from a server, and then at the next table over there, and you watch them giving great service to that table, but damn it, your beer is empty and you want another beer. You gotta wait for them to finish giving that great service that they just gave you to that other table. Or you can just scan your QR code, put your beer in, and they're gonna get alerted and they're gonna go get your beer before they come back and see you. Think about what that does from a hospitality perspective, how happy it makes you, and how much quicker you got that person that beer. Is there another question? So that those QR codes are unique to the space? Unique to the table, yeah. They've actually, like, I'm not trying to do a promo for toast. Um, <laughs> they've actually stepped it up a level where when they first rolled it out, every table had to see all the same set of menus. Now they've done it so that if you have a, um, a patio menu that's only this food and you have an inside fine dining menu, that's another set of food or whatever it may be, then um, you can actually say these QR codes are gonna see these menus and these QR codes are gonna see those menus. That's why we really wanted to get into that hotel across the street because we knew we couldn't sell them liquor, we'd be violating our off-premise liquor license, or on-premise liquor license, but we knew we could send them food and we could send them canned beer. So we just simply would check the boxes for those menus, stick that QR code in that hotel room, and imagine you have a customer that rings that thing up, we know it's going to the hotel, so we know it's to go, and we can send them whatever food we want and whatever packaged beer we want. 
So you have some really good flexibility with it. And that's, and that's like, uh, so you don't run into a lot of issues with your service staff having to hunt down uh, customers. They, they're aware that they, they kind of so is, there, is there a host at your facility? We do when it's busy, there's a host, but typically when it's, when it's not the summer, we have a huge outdoor space and then we only have like 95 occupancy inside. The minute you walk in that front door, you're actually in front of our bartenders. So we've kind of trained our bartenders to, if they know the person and they've been there, they know where to go and what to do. If they don't, is it your first time here? Great, you can sit at any table. If you're comfortable, you can start on the QR code. Otherwise, someone's gonna be by to see you. And then it's either those bartenders, if it's really not that busy, or we will have a, a server out on the floor <coughs> and checking on those tables. Another question? Yeah, so just with the QR, uh, did you see an increase in revenue that you see more? I'd love to tell you what we had an increase in revenue, but it's our we opened up with it. Opened yeah, up. yep. I can tell you from other restaurants that I've worked at, and I use Toast at the other one that I own, um, the turn time is definitely quicker. The check average is higher, but I'm in a more affluent place with this restaurant than the other restaurant. Um, and But I would say the adoption rate on those QR codes is somewhere between 20 and 30% of all of our checks get that QR code at some time through the process. I was hoping it was going to be higher, but uh, even at that level, it, it still pays off. Uh, we're actually implementing QR codes. We started last night, but our original model for the first five years was uh, flags with numbers. And so we have one through 50. The QR is unique to each flag. So let me just say, I can't tell you whether it's going to increase or not. It was last night. Was Great. Are you using flags still? We are using flags still. And does the flag, the flag stay is, on the table, or does yeah, the customer pick the flag up? The customer goes. <coughs> so the challenge. Back, back, group up from yeah. The patio. We're on a golf course, uh, full service restaurant. We're technically a group hub. So yeah. what we're trying to work out is how, what's the flow? Do we divert them to the table, give them the flag, let them potentially experience the QR, but for the first five years they've done everything at the bar. So we're, we're a hybrid as well. Yeah. So, so I, would, I would call us like counter service. Yeah. Um, and now you want to... Out there a little yep. bit, but the, but the uh, majority of the OS was basically catered to the golf course and not a full service restaurant. Yeah. So we're wondering to what extent... Did you switch you POS systems to use your own? We, we switched. Yeah. No, 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 we both switched. To okay. A, to Okay. It's not Toast, but we look at Toast. Yeah. It's light speed because they have a, a, a golf module. Yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, what I'm kind of worried about is, I guess I want to ask you, you said you do some full service and some hybrid. Do you switch by days or do you switch by area? We switch by whatever the customer wants. The QR code is on every single table. So one of the things that you were talking about would be my concern is what I don't want to do. What the benefit of the QR, table, QR code on the table is, we, you know, you've got F1 through F4, and you've got D1 for our deck, and you've got C1 for our courtyard. We know where those tables are. They're static. That QR code is on that table. So when they order, it goes back to a KDS in the kitchen, and then the, the food runner, whoever it is that's going to bring out the food, sees the table number, and they know exactly where they're going. So my concern with the way that you're potentially thinking about doing it is if I give them this QR code and I let them take it wherever they want, all of a sudden you're hunting down to find that. We've been hunting them down for five years because I'm gonna, sure, right, and and that was what you did for five years, and, and it worked, and I don't mean to discredit it, but you're you're gonna speed that process up if you don't have to hunt that customer down, and you just have a QR code at each table. So now you're, I used to do this, I used to run a bar where we did wing night, and we had a little flags without QR codes or anything, and we were, you know, it was. It was number 32, and then you had to run on this story. Oh, no, they're not on the first floor, and then they go up to the second floor. You're going to save a tremendous amount of efficiency. It's all about saving steps. I didn't talk about it in the full service model, but if you're doing full service and you don't have handhelds, I mean, I understand like really fine dining places don't want handhelds because they don't want that to interrupt the service or whatever, but most brew pubs are a little bit more casual. Get a handheld. No matter, I don't care what system it is. Get a handheld. You will save steps on that server. I'm going back and forth to the server station to ring that in. I still go to brew pubs and all the time, and I'm like, just any system that has a handheld would be a huge advantage. So I would consider just getting a QR code for each table. We considered burning it into the table. We didn't do that. We actually have a cute little metal sign with a sticker. Well, unlike Toast, they said they could not have, they couldn't split checks at the table. Uh, oh. So, so it was, 
once you had one, no one could be added to it. So I looked at the toast as well. Yeah. The toast didn't have a golf element. Yeah. So yeah. And they, I don't know if anybody's ever dealt with POS, they tend to over promise and under deliver. Yeah. <coughs> Yeah. Um, so I wanted to actually get through the, uh, the other uh, service model. Um, the hybrid one, or sorry, the split. Um, we, we did talk about the, the hybrid. The split was the, the newer one. So what are the pros of that split where the kitchen, you know, you guys are brewers and you made beer and everything. I've been on both sides of it. I made beer and I loved it and I didn't have to deal with the restaurant. And now uh, this guy talked me into opening the restaurant and here we are back into it. What's the pro? What's the biggest pro of a split model? You don't have to worry about a kitchen. That is a wonderful thing. Even our craft beer bar. I love the beer. I love everything, the atmosphere of it. But man, the hardest part of doing this is the kitchen. Whether it's making the food, it's the health department, it's the staffing back there. It's everything else like that. Um, that's a real huge advantage, I think, in that split model, if you're able to pull it off. Um, you have the potential to change that food menu pretty quickly and pretty easily, right? Like, if you want to bring people back, I know we all make new beers and try different things and everything else like that, but imagine if you have this brew pub that you really, really love their beer, but you know, you're know you kind of tired of, that's why we did rationales. We're not pub food, we're soup salad sandwich. We're like an alternative. We try to give you a little bit like the old Blue Tusk in Syracuse. Um, but we try to offer something different. Imagine if you have that split model and every quarter or every couple months, you could put a new menu in there. Imagine the repeat customers that you're gonna get just from that perspective. So there's a potential for that. Obviously it's less capital investment. Somebody was talking to us today about putting a hood in or something else like that. And I'm like, yep, you know, these are the places that you gotta go and do that. Obviously the cons um, from that perspective is you're creating a, a partnership, whether you like it or not, right? Um, you're creating a partnership with whoever's gonna do that food component. Unless it is unless it is you and you just decided to split the food area off and use a different system than, than the bar. I have been to one uh, place locally that did that. I don't know if the ownership was different or not, but it, it runs into the other con is that um, it can be confusing, right? Like, well, why do I gotta go get my beer over here and then I gotta go get my food over here? I don't know the legalities of it, I'm not a legal person. If it were me and I was doing this split thing with a different kitchen, I'd probably run it all through my POS and then just get them the revenue back that they had to get back to, for their food component of it. But it can be a little bit confusing on, on how you set that up. You obviously have legal and structural you know, things you have to consider when you're doing this, this split kitchen thing. Um, and then you know, the other thing is I know I don't like to do kitchens, but it is less revenue and potentially less profit. It is, if you run a kitchen correctly, it, it can be a, a profitable component in your, um, in your, in your model. South pour walls, um, what's the pros? Man, you can do that with absolutely no labor. You can do it with one person, doing credit cards at the front, checking to make sure people are not over consuming and they're the beer concierge and talking around um, the place in Buffalo. Uh, it's supposed to be called a poor tap room. I mean, they love it because they're right near the theater district and some nights, the theater lets out and they get, you know, five people and then other nights it lets out and they get 50 people and they can handle any and all of that volume. They have wine on tap, they have beer on tap. You have to be a little careful with cocktails. There is ways to do cocktails on tap, but you have to follow some of the archaic SLA rules for that. Um, it is, uh, it's new, right? Like, there's something to be said about that. People are like, ooh, this is cool. Let's go pour our own beer and everything else like that. Um, and you can use that self pour wall with other models, right? You can have a full service restaurant and a self pour wall. You could do a high, we're actually toying around, we don't have the money right now, but sticking a self pour wall on the outside of our patio because our patio can hold like 150 people. And imagine if we can let them go up and, and, and serve themselves up to a certain point. Um, the cons, it, it's an upfront expense. Those systems are not cheap, right? Um, it is the lowest hospitality component of it. If you don't do it correctly, if you don't go out and talk to those customers about the beer, um, is it a niche, you know? It is a little bit of a niche type thing that everybody's gonna wanna do that. Um, you know, and then you're, you, you have some legal hoops that we talked about, I think we covered that with, you know, what if you over serve somebody, something along those lines. Um, before we open it up to any and all questions, Eric's gonna go into like, how do you decide like which service model is the best for you? And this may be if, if you're planning on opening up or if you're already opened up and maybe you're thinking about considering uh, shifting off what you're doing. <clears throat> Thanks, and to that point, when you're trying to find your fit, whether you've been open for a while, because you could open up as a brewing company with a little tasting room, then all of a sudden I'm gonna add a tap room, and all of a sudden I'm gonna make it bigger, or you open up right out of the gate with a larger space. What is your concept? Are you more production with that tasting room? Are you production with the tap room? Or are you 
a brewing company, but you're more of a restaurant just due to what you offer, what you do, and everything else like that. And when you're trying to figure that out, you also want to hopefully be taking into what is that vision? What are you trying to execute based on? We want to make really good beer. We want people to be able to just sit and relax and have a good time. Well, then you might be more, you know, going towards the hey, I got a, I got a, you know, a tasting room. I have a lot of space to sit down, or you know, a easy end of a tap room, or you're going to want to go more towards uh, downtown Buffalo, like a big ditch where you walk in. They're a large brewing company, but they have a massive facility and a lot of dining space and a lot of event space just to accommodate. They are as much of a restaurant as they are a brewing company, so you really got to take that in. And then, obviously, as you all know, you got to think of your target audience. Um, are you in a college town or just outside of a college town? Are you in a downtown major city? I mean, New York City, you have your own set of you know, things you got to figure out there. So as you're thinking to that audience, you know, are they younger, are they older, based on that um, demographic of you know, size. And then also, dine-in versus takeout. Are you going to be something where it's like, we're going to have very minimal food? They're going to come in, they're going to eat, they're going to enjoy it, and then they go home, hopefully take a packaged product of the, the liquid. Or... Are you somebody who is going to do a, you know, more of a larger model and you are going to have takeout and you want that to be able to be available? You know, you got to factor all of those things in as you're trying to think of all of that because that then impacts labor, impacts size, impacts, you know, so many other things. And then also, let's be real, your footprint. Everybody, you know, wants to have maybe something to have, but if you have a very small space, you got to play with what you got. Maybe you have a small space but a larger outdoor courtyard area or you happen to have a really decent footprint not much of a patio then okay what way am i going to go here to really accommodate and maximize you know you know the number of guests that we can get through the door and all of those things do uh really play into that from you know the full service you know most room all the way down to you know when it's just self-serve and you know you can have any kind of space you want because it's minimal labor and you work with what you got those those things come to mind we stopped at brewery arden uh, which is um uh, south of geneva uh, at one point, and, and just his concept, his target audience, and his footprint, like we talked about, he's got a huge outdoor space. And if you haven't been there, does a lot of Belgian beers. It's very traditional, beautiful building, everything else like that. And I'm like, part of me says, man, you should get those QR codes outside because you can do all this extra business and everything else like that. But then when you look at the old school Belgianness, uh, by the way, when you're going there, you should go visit Kyle at Big Alice too. He's uh, right down the road at Great Beers as well. Um, but you know, maybe he doesn't want to present that self-service thing because it's it's more about the look and the feel of the old you know farmhouse thing along those lines. And then I'm sure he's got a slightly older clientele there because of that. And it, you know, it is the summer, um, so you, you got to fact. There's no there's no silver bullet like you should pick one or the other. Other things you want to think about from your fit is uh, your menu. You know, uh, are you do you have food? Are you, obviously, are you going to have food? But then, do you have uh, liquor? You know, you might have legal requirements that you have to do. We talked about that. Um, you may have legal restrictions. Do you need a menu, and what does that menu need to be, and how are you serving that from that perspective? Um, tech considerations are are big. Not you know, the gentleman here in the gray sweatshirt. It's not every POS system is different is uh, equal. Some do things better. Some do things worse. Um, they all suck in some ways, and they all do something that no other one does that you think you really need. And it's really trying to figure out which one's going to work for you. You are going to need a, a networking guru or a support guy or an IT guy. I'm pretty good with tech, pretty good with the interface, everything else like that. But then when it comes to like building Wi-Fi networks, because a lot of these things require that stuff, um, I'm fortunate enough to have a brother and a cousin who are really good at it, do it professionally, and they help us set it up. But you, <laughs> the note that I have in here is, you, do, you, do you got an IT guy? Because it, it's going to be necessary when you're, when you're getting off just that standard service model. Then you got to think about costs too, right? There are upfront costs. There are recurring costs, and then the hidden one is there's the credit card fees. No matter what POS system, you're gonna use a POS system if you have a service model, and no matter what POS system you use, you have to factor in all three of those. They love to give you the upfront for free because you're like, ooh, I don't have to spend any money on the system. But then what's the recurring monthlies? And then more importantly, you know, a couple percentage points, right? What one percentage point on a million bucks is, you even have right, 10 grand. Um, one percentage point, I'm not saying, but even a half percentage point is $5,000. So what is your credit card fees that you're paying on that? Because that could be uh, nothing in comparison to, or that could be a lot in comparison to what they're, they're charging you for the monthly. Yeah, question. question on that. What percentage of your moral sales do you find in the card 
Uh, we're in a rather affluent suburb of Buffalo, Williamsville. We're north of 90%. Yeah, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty, and I, I fortunately was a restaurant consultant for five years before we opened this. I knew how to negotiate credit cards pretty well, and I negotiated some very good credit card rates for us, but um, it's really important to, to look at that total package when you're, when you're putting that in. Yeah? So, we, we've had, and we're going to close one of our spots, but we have, we've had two spots in New York City, and one spot up in Geneva, uh, just talking about and one of the things I found most interesting when we opened up in Finger Lakes was how much cash was coming in because our our spot in uh, Brooklyn was seven percent cash, uh, Queens was four percent cash, and then uh, Geneva was a forty-two or something. 45. So uh, and then I find a bunch of people like the other locations where there were cash only. I'm like, you're leaving ninety something percent of your business. You know, uh, on the table by, by not accepting credit cards, but, but to just point, just price to include the fees. You know, whatever. Yeah. And they, they all end up being about the same. We, we went shopping every time we opened the location, figure out what the best meal was. They all do it differently, but they all end up costing us about the same. This won't be fun. So, yeah, it comes to like, does it fit if you're on a golf course or what you're really interested in, like, a restaurant or whatever. So, yeah, we're 90% credit card, but on Thursdays that music on main, <laughs> we're probably like 50-50. That means we're like 95 to 96% most of the time. Um, but it's just because that day we're, we're truly a bar. We're, we're doing tax inclusive on everything. I mean, there's so many little tricks. You feel free to have my contact information and give me a call. There's so many little tricks that these POS systems do that get you these, this percentage point. Even how you do tax on alcohol versus alcohol plus food over the bar. Think about it, if you want to come in and you want to buy a beer and you only want to buy a beer and you want to pay eight bucks, I want to give you eight bucks and not give you eight dollars and 64 cents, right? So I charge eight bucks for that beer if it's coming across the bar like that. But the minute you put food on there and it's all complicated, it gets messy. Well, I, when I charge you eight dollars, I'm really getting eight dollars, and sorry, seven dollars and 36 cents for that beer and I'm getting 64 cents to the state. But the minute I charge you eight dollars for that beer and then get 64 cents more from you than I give to the state, I just made that 64 cents. So we don't do it when it's quick transactions of cash on that Thursday, but if any other night of the week you sit down at the bar and you order a beer and then 10 minutes later you order a burger, the price of that beer went from seven thirty-six to $8 automatically. You're thinking, oh, Jim, it's only 64 cents or whatever. 64 cents times the number of times that happens is probably close to 10 grand a year <laughs> exactly. in our restaurant. So if your POS doesn't have that feature, <clears throat> you might be leaving 10 grand on the table or you just make everyone pay that 64 cents, which slows our bar down. So it's, it's all those little nuances and things that go in there that you have to think about from, from that perspective. But the other thing I'll say is everybody wants cash. I mean, if you really want to, I'm not here to judge. If you really want to avoid sales tax and stuff like that, I'm not going to tell you what you should or shouldn't do. But if you're truly going to do it legally the right way, I don't want to handle cash. People waste time counting that cash. There's more theft on that cash. It's much more difficult to have any kind of theft on a credit card along those lines. So. I hate to pay those guys the percent that they get, and it's a lot lower in Europe and everywhere else. We're getting robbed over here, but um, but credit cards are obviously a lot more efficient. We have a couple questions. We have a couple over here and one over here. So, uh, yep, you, uh, whoever over here wants to go first, go ahead. I just have a quick comment. Like also on, on the US systems, uh, we use Square, which goes as well. Um, and like you can negotiate those credit card fees depending on what your like, credit card uh, like sales <coughs> If you, if you haven't talked to them yet, or like do that, do check in with them, like talk to them, like understand what your sales are and what your what your power is and what you have, and like talk to them because you, you got to talk about like yeah. you know it's yeah. very small because you know it's like went from like two point nine to two point five, but it's you know it's so just so you know, toast will not go below two point four. That's their latest. <laughs> so if you went to two point five, that's good. But let's say you do a million dollars in sales yeah. and you go from two point nine to two point four. That's a half a percent. That's five grand in your pocket in perpetuity per year. Um, Toast does it two ways. There's no way from Toast in the room. Um, <laughs> Toast does it two ways. Toast will do a flat rate like, like, um, like Square does and a lot of those ones do. There's also a thing if you're larger, if you're, doing, if you're processing more than say a million dollars in a year, there's something called Interchange Plus and it's basically interchange. Every card costs different to your restaurant. Some people just blend it together and give you one rate. Interchange Plus says, no, you're going to pay the rate on that card. Then we're going to take a small vig on top of it. 
typically Interchange Plus is cheaper for the operator for the restaurant than a flat rate. Think about the flat rate is, I better get a rate that's high enough that covers all the really expensive cards and the cheap ones and the, the blended. It's like buying insurance on your credit card. But if you can get Interchange Plus, if you're processing more than a million dollars, come see me at the end of it, even if you have toast. And you can go back to toast and once you've signed up with them and say, hey, I got a quote for a lower rate. What can you do to match it? Doesn't mean they're gonna get you down to that rate, but any sliver you can get off them is money in your pocket that doesn't go to the processor. So, uh, a little bit of a question here. Like, uh, like when you say with self-service, right, you lose that, that beer tender interaction, right, where they're getting to talk to the person about it. Like, I've kind of had this theory in our industry that the customer cares less about that than you think. Um, and so, like, I would ask, like, what have you seen suffer from doing that self-service? Because like, I think the only thing that I would look at is package beer sales, right? Like you lose that ability to ask somebody, do you want beer to go home with you? But like, other than that, do you see like an effect on your sales from those people that participate in the self-service versus the full service, or is it relatively flat? You, you can, um, with some POS systems, you can suggestively sell, I don't know that the one that we use, Toast, allows you to suggestively sell it at checkout. That would be a great option if it did to say, hey, before you go, you know, and then sell it at a discount. Yeah, do you want to take this to go or whatever? Or do you know that we have beer to go? I think suggestive selling is is, is something that can be lost. The the ability for a, a, a computer system to suggestively sell something up front is, is a little bit less than a server coming over in saying that. Um, I think... You know, we do a pretty good job. We're smart beer guys, but um, we do a pretty good job of explaining to our, our staff what beers taste like what, et cetera. I, I would guess there's probably some loss in if you're not interacting with our, with our server or bartender first and you're just kind of going on, well, it says it's a hazy IPA or a New England IPA or whatever, I'm going to go get it. You know, we're probably better at telling people at the bar, like, mm, you don't want that one, <laughs> you know, which isn't always the greatest for us because it doesn't, it doesn't pull through, but um, you, you don't get that guided tour. It's now, again, some people wait to have that server come over. And, you know, the system that we have, the, 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 the patron can start the check, and then the server can add to it, and then the patron can check out, or the server can check them out, or vice versa. The server can start the check, and the patron can then add to it, and then whoever they want can cash it out. So it, you can really pick it up and put it down anywhere throughout the process. And, and that's where you're, again, coaching your staff. So, you know, if there's drink orders in, you know, maybe you coach them to say, hey, why did you pick that beer? Just so you know, we have this other one if you're interested in a second. Um, and that suggestive selling when they see it that it's partway empty, the servers, you got to teach them to always check in at these tables. They're just not doing the transactional order as frequently, and they're not cashing people out. Even if you don't use QR codes, there's QR codes on the cash out receipts right now that um, you can just pay via the QR code. And that's a really, that's a really important thing from that perspective. We had one other question over here. We, I do not, I don't believe, and everyone's gonna have a belief on this, I do not believe in charging the customer anything related to that credit card rate. I believe in setting your prices and then working that in as an as a overhead operating cost of business. To me, it's just a cost of running the POS system, and I look at it as a totality. I understand that spot on is uh, probably the closest that I've seen to what Toast does from, a, uh, um, you know, from that perspective. Spot on does have the option to allow you to pay cash and get a discount. You have to be very, very uh, correct in how you do that. There is a nuanced way where it is 100% legal, and if you don't do it, it's 100% illegal. Talk to your accountant, talk to whoever about that, I don't remember exactly what it was, but it, yeah, I don't know if it can't be a discount or it can't be a service, I think it can be a discount, can't be a charge added on. Um, but talk to your accountant about that, there's, there's some complexities with that. Um, I did want to get into, you know, what did we see from our experience? We were a hybrid model. Um, the first thing we learned is customers will have a say. Jim had a great idea how we were going to roll this out, and this is how we were going to do it. And we got some grumblings from the staff, but we got them to kind of get on board, and then we released it out to the customers. And they told us, mm, we don't really like you strongly suggesting that we use the QR code. And we, we didn't come out with paper menus. Guess what? We, find, we, had, we had QR codes that you could order from, and then QR codes where you could just see the menu. 
and then all to the <coughs> paper menus. But we learned things like, hey, yeah. our beers change so often. Don't print your beer menu. Have a printed food menu and have a QR code just for the beer menu. So you, you capture people's ability to say, OK, I can have a, a tactile menu, but also I'll go on there and I'll look for those beers from that perspective. Your customers are, are going to have a say, and they're going to tell you how to do it. Um, don't force it. I think we tried to push it and suggest it, and highly suggest it. And then we kind of, after taking some feedback from both customers and reviews online and uh, our staff, we went back out and was a little bit more of a gentler approach. But I, I did have staff that when they started didn't want anything to do with these QR codes, and then they worked the $1,500 lunch on their own, walked out of there with 350 bucks in tips, and realized that they couldn't have done it without those QR codes. So um, there's something to be said for that. I think paper options, uh, paper physical menu options is a must if you're going to do that hybrid model. Some people are just going to want them. We have everything from um, millennials who don't talk to anyone to do the whole transaction on the credit card to older folks who come in and they want a tax on and pay in cash. And you got to be able to, to do all that. Um, training your staff is really important. You have to train them how to use the system like the ins and outs of it. Then you gotta train them how to use the system, right? It's like, do you know how to play this game or do you know how to play this game? And so you have to teach them when it's gonna be more beneficial and how to, you know, if it's getting busy, you better have a good pitch on how you're gonna get people to hopefully use that QR code because if they don't, it's gonna take them a little bit longer to get their food and you to get to them. So there's, there's things that you have to train your staff on. I will say this, and it's made it a lot easier, you're probably looking at pooling tips. I'm a huge proponent of pooling tips. Um, Toast has an excellent tip pooling module. It does cost a little bit more money, but it saves me hours every week on payroll. And I, I just think tip pooling, once you get the super old school servers to kind of buy into it and realize that they are making more money, um, uh, I, I just think it's the way to go. I think it's more efficient. I think the employees make more money. You have to staff less people. They self-police themselves. If someone's not pulling their weight, you're gonna not hear it. You're gonna hear from all of them. Like, cut this person, get them off, they really can't. You know, and then they, they pick up and they support each other and they can flex and flow to wherever they need to in the restaurant. We have private event space, huge patio, bar. Our, our, our bartenders, sometimes our servers go behind the bar and do the dishes for the bartenders because help them catch up because they're getting beat to them. You know, they're getting handed to them. But you know what, they're still making tips. Or someone's sitting around, they have to be on this private event and they're sitting there, but the private event's got, you know, $600 of tips associated with it because it's a $3,000 private event. And those bartenders are like, yeah, we're getting a slice of that even though we're not working it, right? So I think pooling tips is, is probably the best way to go. Another little sidebar, if you want to make, you sh I personally believe you should charge your employees the 25 to 3% that you pay for those credit cards. You should charge them that for the tips that they make. You hold the responsibility for paying the credit card fees on the sale because that revenue comes to the house. You are kindly taking the credit card fees on the sales tax because it makes it easier to collect it and give it to the state. But you're putting those credit cards and those systems in place and those servers are making a lot of money on those tips. I think it's okay and I know it, I know it is legal to charge them whatever your credit, average credit card rate is to, to receive those credit card tips. And they'll give uh, no, it's done automatically in the POS. <laughs> no, the, but also just like with the whole tip pooling, it took our staff a couple months to kind of come around to all of this, but Jim being a number wizard was able to sit down and show, here's what you get from this, here's what you wouldn't get if we didn't do it. And they're like, oh, okay. Oh, and you had a question? We do tip pooling and just Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. So do the math. On a million dollars, there's two hundred thousand dollars of tips, and if you hold back two and a half percent of those two hundred thousand dollars, that's again another five grand. That pays for your POS. And you also have, do you have a question as well? Mm -hmm. We have um, three drawers and two terminals. One terminal has two drawers, one has one drawer. And we, depending upon how we set it up that day, it will go to one of those two terminals and it will print tickets. Yep. You can also do. That's their job to 
to service these We make our bartenders always pay attention yeah. both so that way no one person, if somebody gets bogged down but they're the person who's supposed to pay attention to it, you want to ensure that, I mean, if you have one person, <clears throat> this is no brainer about the two person, yeah. I mean, we should, it's going to go to one ticket, it's going to go to the one that that terminal that that person is on and yeah. that person should be making those drinks. It doesn't mean that the other person doesn't come down to the other end of the bar and have money. We, we, nope, the two terminals are behind the bar, and then when you ring in a ticket and we're on a standard day, it's going to go to the one, obviously the window one, it's going to go to the window, the bartender that's on that is going to make that ticket, but if that bartender is doing something else with a customer, and the other one that's, you know, six to eight feet away isn't doing anything, they'll go down and make that ticket. That's the beauty of pooling those tips, right, because they want, they all want to get this drunk, this drink made. And then, yes, the, the, the drink does get run to the table, usually by the server. But again, if the server's somewhere else and they're not that busy, they're going to go run that drink. If I call them, always stay prepared, always stay prepared, always stay prepared, always be ready to get hit, then, you know, you're out in front of it. And listen, I think the least paid server in our restaurant makes more than what we're going <laughs> to, more than what we're offering here at GM, and we're paying him a lot of money. I mean, our servers make north of $40, $40 on the books. On the books, let alone you know, because they're working hard and they're pooling, and, and and again, we're scheduling as minimal as possible to get through. Yeah, that's huge. The labor save. Are you pulling the test? Do you do it by hours or by like what's the easiest way to? Again, not all POS systems are equal, and I don't want to sound like I'm a salesperson for Toast, but um, Toast allows you to do it, pull up whole tips for the whole day, and divide it by the number of hours worked. Then Toast says you can split it into day parts. And if you work the night, or if you work the day, you're going to be in the pool, and we're going to split those pools by the number of hours you worked in those pools. And then Toast says, we'll do it one step further. If you're on the clock when the check is opened, you're in that tip pool. So every check is its own pool. And if you're on the clock when it's opened, you're in that pool. And <laughs> furthermore, because the bartenders do more than the host, so our bartenders get five points in whatever pool they're in and our servers get five points in whatever pool they're in. They're equally as important to me. But that host only gets two points because all they're doing is bussing tables and seating people and everything else like that. So what it works out to is, like I said, our bartenders and servers on the books are north of 40 bucks and our hosts are in the 25 to $30. And do you pay the host more hourly? Uh, no, no, because, you know, and I, I don't know, that's more of a philosophy thing, like if you think the, I also think that host is really more important in a full service environment than they are in like a hybrid or a self service environment. The host in our in our scenario is making sure the table's open, making sure stuff gets to the table, making sure it's cleaned off, making sure the wait list is done. They are they're they're very important, don't get me wrong. But we also try to have an owner be up there, try to have a GM be up there, somebody else like that. And you will also find for those bartenders or servers who might come in a minute or two later, whatever. Oh yeah. There's a there's an event at six o'clock, and that event is a four thousand dollar event. If they clock in at six o one, they are not in the tip pool. And we tell them, oh, that's not fair. It's like, well, you start at six. You're supposed to be here a few minutes before. We have found literally the people who are not like late, late, but just that little bit. The minute they find out they lost X, they're like, oh, uh, they're never late again. Well, we, we do the tip pool. I do it manually, so I do it, I do it myself. Ooh. How many, how many hours does it take you? <laughs> I mean, it just, it's usually about an hour probably. Per day? Yeah. So that's seven hours a week. At a minimum, you are worth $20 an hour. That's $140 a week. That is $560 a month. That is $7,000 a year. Do the math. It's just important to think about that. Yep. <laughs> um, but my follow-up is, so do you pay all the tips for your paycheck? I am a huge advocate of paying all of the tips into a paycheck for this reason, well, multiple reasons. Number one, it is cash flow, right? So if you're holding on to those tips and then you're putting them in their check, on average you have about a seven days because beginning of the, beginning of the week to the end of the week and it's paid at that point, you have about a seven day. At, and you know, again, the do $20,000 in sales a week, that's a, that's a typical million dollar restaurant, $20,000, so there's, uh, 20%, there's going to be $4,000 in tips. I've got $4,000 in the bank for seven more days than I typically would. That's number one. Number two, I don't think your employees understand the value of what they make at your restaurant. You are not paying them that money, but you are giving them the environment and the opportunity to earn that money. So when you ask them, how much do you make? And they say, how much do you make here? And they say, oh, you pay me $10 an hour. Well, yeah, you're right, but you earn $40 an hour here. So having them see that, I think, is extremely important. 
in, in kind of them understanding what they're making. But I, I'm a huge, huge proponent of putting it in the paycheck. You also don't have to go to the bank. I mean, we're 90% credit cards. I'd be going to the bank to get the cash tips, to get the cash to pay them their tips every night. And then I'd, I'd just be, money would get deposited and I'd be keep pulling money out to pay them cash, so. Um, one last thing, I will, and then if there's any other questions, we can hang out. Um, there's surprisingly little fraud, little fraud for us. That was one thing we learned. I think that has a little bit more to do with we're in an affluent um, neighborhood and you know the typical customer that we have. But the level of fraud that we have for like someone not paying a check is is minimal. Occasionally, people don't realize, and something happens, and we end up having to. Um, end up having to explain to them how the credit card transaction happened via the system. But overall, we see very little fraud. Any other questions? Thank you guys Thanks so guys much for coming in. I appreciate you.